Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 103 on New Testament Survey. Today, we're going to study on the Gospel of John. So last class, we looked into the Gospel of Luke. And that uh, you know, ends the Synoptic Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Today, we're going to study on the Gospel of John. So even before I could start with our session, may I request one of you all to please uh, start the session with a word of prayer. Anyone from the class, you all can unmute and pray. Karen, would you like to pray? Anyone from the class can pray. Jesus, we thank you, God, for this day in our lives, O oh Lord, Father. Thank you for once again uh, giving us the privilege, O oh Lord, Father, to come together in your name and uh, study about your word, O oh Lord, Father, as we are going to dive in into your word, O oh Lord, Father. Uh, give us your understanding, O oh Lord. Uh, give us your spirit, O oh Lord, Father. Open our minds, open our hearts, O oh Lord, Father, to understand uh, everything that you are teaching us, Lord, through Dynamam, O oh Lord, Father. We submit our minds, we submit our hearts into your hands. You come and you have your ways in our lives, Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Okay, let me share the slide. Okay, everyone can see the presentation. Everyone can see the presentation. Okay, so today we're going to study the Gospel of John. So Gospel of John talks about, it is written to, it is, it is a universal gospel. It is written to the world. Well, the Gospel of John is also known as the book of the Son of God. Gospel of John is also known as the book of the Son of God. So the gospel according to John is the fourth of the four New Testament gospels. And John is the only gospel that's not included under the synoptic gospels. So the first three gospel focuses more on what Jesus thought and did. And the gospel of John focuses on who Jesus is. It focuses more on the deity of Jesus. So what do we know about the author? What do we know about the author of the Gospel of John? He was one of Jesus' disciples. Okay. He is the brother of James. Okay. That's nice. also the follower of John the Baptist. Okay, that was very good. Okay, so John was evidently among the Galileans who followed John the Baptist. Very good. Thanks, Prince, for sharing that. He was following John the Baptist until they were called to follow Jesus on his public ministry. So these Galileans were later called to become the full-time disciples of Lord Jesus. We see when we study the Gospel of Luke. And John was among one among the 12 men who were selected to be the apostle of Jesus. So John was basically a Jew. Okay. And he lived, he's from the town of Bethesda. Can we see the map on our screen? You see the town of Bethsaida. On the west shore, uh, uh, on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee, here lived the fishermen. Zebedee, 
with his wife Salome and he had two sons James and John. So we can see that in the map, Sea of Galilee, a Bethsaida, that's where Zebedee lived with his family. So when we come to talk about John, Apostle John, John was a Jew and he was familiar with the Jewish customs and feast. John lived in Palestine and were very familiar with Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas. We also see that he's from a, a quite well-off background because they had their own boats because his father hired the fishermen to take care of the boats. And they seem to be ha uh, uh, to have their own place, own house. And they were also cousin of Jesus. So when we look at the ministry side of John, John started a spirit spiritual journey as the disciple of John the Baptist. He was also called by Jesus while he was engaging in the fishing business with his father. And uh, we also see that he worked alongside with Peter and his brother, Andrew. So John was chosen by Jesus himself as one of the 12 disciples. When they were fishing, Jesus just walked on to them and said, follow me. And he and his brother James later part. What was they nicknamed as? Sons of Thunders. Why do you think Jesus gave this name to them? Why were they known as Sons of Thunders? Sorry? Yes, maybe because of the boldness that they carried within themselves. And some say in, uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, Gospel of Luke chapter 9, um, verse 51 to 56. Can we just quickly turn to Gospel of Luke chapter 9? Fifty one to fifty six. Okay, so I'll just keep it short because of time. They always were, there was always a drift be, uh, between the Jews and the Samaritans. When Jesus, along with James and John, they were traveling on ministry to another place, they encountered a group of Samaritans and where the Samaritans, you know, opposed them from entering into their village. So what the reaction of James and John toward the opposite people, the Samaritans, you know, they literally said like, Lord, do you want us to command? I'm, I'm reading verse 54. Okay. Here they say, uh, and when his disciples, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But then what Jesus did, he turned and he rebuked them and he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So he is bringing a correction to them. And then eventually they went to another village. Uh, we also see that John became part of Jesus' inner circle of the three, James, John and Peter, with the inner circle. So, which what are the instances in the in the scripture that we make sure that they were the three always with Jesus? Yes, one is at the transfiguration. Sorry, at the Garden of Gethsemane. One more place. When when he raised Jairus' daughter. Okay, so these are some things that we need to remember that how these three people, James, John, and Peter, were always present with Jesus. There's nothing that Jesus had partiality, but then they were for a long time with Jesus in the ministry, okay? That may be one of the reasons. And also there can be another reason, like Jesus wanted these three people to be raised in the leadership as well, okay? And we see that later part, how they, they grew in the ministry of Jesus ministry uh, well he and his brother 
James requested a place of honor. We also see that, you know, his mom walks up to Jesus, says, can you give a prominent place to my son, one on the left and the other on the right? And then Jesus said, that's not in my hand, but that's in God's hand, Father's hand. We also see John refers to himself as uh, whom Jesus loved. I am the beloved of Jesus. You know, throughout the gospel of John, even if you read John 1, 2, and 3, you see he addressing himself as Jesus' beloved. Okay, so Jesus entrusted John with the most if you see the ministry, he, he entrusted with the most important thing in his life, that is his mother. At the time of crucifixion, John was present near the cross, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Jesus from the cross, you know, he looks at John. John, behold your mother. He is, he is handing over his mom to John to take care of. John was also the eyewitness of what has been recorded. Most of the uh, uh, events that took place in the ministry of Jesus, John was the eyewitness, of which he gives a revelation of who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, verse 14, what, was it, what does it say? John chapter 1, verse 14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He gives that innermost understanding, understanding of who Jesus is. The word which was in the beginning with God has now become flesh and dwelling with us. So John became a later part in the ministry. We see that John became a key leader along with Peter, establishing a church in Jerusalem. So we see that he grew in his leadership, even though he was youngest, but he grew in his leadership. And he was also trained by Peter. And his brother James was one of the first of the 12 to be martyred. Okay, he was beheaded by the order of King Herod Agrippa, the first of Judea. And also in John 21, when we read, verse 20 and 23, uh, saying that, you know, uh, when uh, Peter, then Peter, can we turn to John chapter 1? Let's read together. John chapter 21, verse 20 and 23. Okay, 2023. Can I request one of y'all to please unmute and read? Thank you. Thank you, Anand, for reading it. Yes, so there was a rumor that he would not die until Christ written. But then the scholars say in the history that John died out of a natural cause. Among all the 12 disciples, most of, I mean, almost everyone were martyred. But then John had a natural death. So the biblical history and the tradition when we look at, John is referred to, to be the apostle of love because he emphasizes on the love on the love in both the gospel and the three epistles john 1 2 and 3 so in this in his gospel he makes over 50 references of love god's love and love and we also see that he believed to have served as a key figure he grew in the leadership and he became a bishop at the church of Ephesus. 
in the uh, later part of the first century. We, and uh, John wrote the gospel that bears his name. And later, as he was serving in the ministry, he was exiled for his faith and taken up to the uh, island of Patmos uh, by the Roman emperor. This is the island of Patmos. Okay, this is how it looks now, maybe much more developed. But this was the island where Apostle John was exiled by the Roman Emperor. So John wrote the three epistles that bear his name and the book of Revelations at the island of Patmos. So John was uh, later released from the exile to return to Ephesus where, uh, you know, uh, he started the church and he was as a one bishop. He served there as a bishop at the church of Jerusalem and later he died out of a natural cause. Perhaps he was the only one to be have died in a natural cause, whereas others were martyred. So when was the Gospel of John written? When was the Gospel of uh, John written? The scholars say in the early church, the early church fathers believe that it was written much later in John's old age, around uh, approximately around 85 to 95 AD, which is almost 20 years after the synoptic Gospels were written. That means Matthew, Mark and Luke were already written. That's when John was trying to write. And John's five books with, uh, with the last, I mean, the, I mean, John's five books, that is Gospel of John, John letter one, two and three and the book of Revelations were written much later. The early church father Eusebius says John lived in Ephesus after Paul founded the church there. From there, he conducted kind of, you know, home mission ministry. So his gospel and the letters were part of that ministry during his leadership there at that place. So that was, yeah. And here in the Gospel of John, we also see the Gospel of John emphasizes on two things. That is God's love, God's love, because he almost uh, God's love and the and this gospel is a ministry to the world. He is writing this letter addressing the universe, universal letter. It is to the world, and the word world here, that is in the Greek cosmos, is used nearly eighty times in the book of John. And also this book emphasizes on two things. Let me change the thing. Emphasizes on two things. That is God the Father has a vision for the world. So how do we know that? It emphasizes on that God the Father has the vision, has a vision for the world. We see two points there. John 3.16 which explains that God loves the world explains God loves the world and John 3 17 says God sent his son into the world now the second emphasis when the first one was God the father as a vision for the world the second one says Jesus as a ministry to the world Jesus as the ministry to the world so under that we see about seven points listed there where he says he is the creator of the world in John 1 10. Can we all turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1? So we can highlight it, mark in our Bible. Okay. Here we see that he is the creator of the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He was a creator. He was in the world. 
he is the creator of the world and verse 9 says that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world so what does it say jesus is the light of the world and verse 29 verse 29 next day john saw jesus coming toward him and said behold the lamp of god who takes away the sin of the world so what does this say jesus is the one who takes away the sins of the world he is a savior he is a redeemer now you see john chapter 4 verse 42 can one of you all read the other person can be ready with john 6 14 the other person 651 and John 17 verse 18. So if y'all are ready with the verse, can y'all please read? John 4 verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This is indeed Christ, the Savior of the world. Anyone is ready with the next 614? Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there, surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Okay, you Jesus. Know, Jesus was a prophet who was to come into the world. Thank you. Verse 51. which I shall give for the life of the world. So Jesus gives life to the world. The next one, chapter 17, verse 18. As you sent me, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Thank you. So we see that Jesus sent his followers into the world. So what is the purpose of writing this book? What is the purpose of writing this book? To tell the world that Jesus Christ is God? Yes, right. So the major purpose of writing this book is mentioned in John 20, verse 31. Yes, you're right, you're right, Vijay. Thanks, Anand, for sharing that point. Yes, so as per this verse, this is the key verse, John 20, 31, which says that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So, so the purpose of writing this book, there are about two purposes. Let me see if I've listed. No. There are two purposes. One is the primary purpose is John's primary intent in this gospel is to make this as an evangelistic book in nature. That's why if you see most of the evangelism, they print only the gospel of John and they give out as a track. The purpose of this gospel of John first is to be evangelistic in nature. Now the second point is John's intent was to verify the deity of Jesus. You see in this gospel there is no genealogy. Matthew, Mark, Luke had a genealogy. Mark didn't have because he's showcasing Jesus as a servant. And the gospel of John do not have a genealogy because he is God. He is in the beginning. That's why he starts, the, the gospel starts that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. So he is, he is talking about the deity of Jesus. Why should John talk about the deity of Jesus? Why is he emphasizing so much on the deity of Jesus? Why do you think? What would have happened during those days? 
what was the culture what was happening what was the circumstance when john was writing this gospel what was the circumstance that was around him if you see some of the scholars who studied that they say that during this time gnosticism was very common and it was prevailing and gnosticism challenged the deity of jesus christ so john had to write this gospel defending the deity or coming against this heresy and also we see that john didn't want to duplicate the gospel of matthew mark and luke that's why it is called a synoptic gospel that which is not there he emphasizes in his gospel and one of the things that he refers to some things that are very uh uh so i mean selectively written only in the gospel of matthew sorry gospel of john is that there, we see that there is there are no parables in the gospel of john like the synoptic gospels only seven miracles are been mentioned in the gospel of john out of which two are common in the other gospel so let me see if i've listed that yes so the miracles recorded in the gospel of john that is turning the water into wine and then healing the noble man's son so in this miracle you see the first one when jesus turned the water into wine we see that jesus demonstrated that he has the authority over the elements and the second miracle we see healing the noble man's son so in this miracle jesus is demonstrating that he has the authority over the space and distance because uh, this uh, he says just by your word my son will be healed i'm not worthy for you to enter my roof lord just speak a word release a word that my son may be healed we also see the third one healing the paralyzed man So what do you see Jesus would have demonstrated in this that Jesus has the authority over the sickness and disease the next miracle feeding the 5000 so what has been demonstrated here which miracle has been de demonstrated here that he's been creative in providing creative provision he demonstrated that and walking over the water that jesus has the authority on the natural laws sixth point we see that healing the man born blind here we see that jesus has the authority both on the natural and the spiritual blindness people could see but they were spiritually blind as well so jesus had to open up their eyes when they say that open up the eyes the understanding came into them and here we see the natural cause of being blind jesus had the authority over the natural and the spiritual blindness the seventh point we see raising jairus daughter from the dead in this miracle we see jesus demonstrating the authority over the dead over dead eighth point calling forth a miracle to catch of fish so here we see that jesus demonstrated the authority over the animal world as well so as we studied on the purpose of this book we will move on move on to the next one that why was this book named as the book of the son of god so here we see okay we see the four emphasis on why this book was named as the son of god first is at the very beginning of this book we see in the verse 1 in the beginning 
was the word and the word was with God. So he's making it very clear that Jesus is the son of God. And because he is the son of God, he was in the creation. There's no one created in. He's not a created being. And hence there is no genealogy. First, that Jesus was in the beginning. So he, he pre-existed. Okay. And equality with God. And the second, you see, When we study the Gospel of John, John continuously refers by what Jesus said, saying, God has his father. God has his father. Most of the time, Jesus says, I and my father are one. I do not do anything except for what I have seen my father do. He always relates himself to the father. I do what my father asked to do. I have a relationship with my father. You know, he's so much inclined with his God. So here you see Jesus relating God to be his father. The third point we see here is that John focuses on the I am's of Jesus. So there are about seven I am's been listed in the gospel of john where jesus says that i am so i've just listed them for us to know here it is but jesus is the i am of the new covenant the first one says i am the bread of life so i am is the jesus in the new covenant so the very first one is i am the bread of life Second, we see in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. And John chapter 10 says, I am the door. And also says, I am the good shepherd. And in chapter 11, 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. And John chapter 14 says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And lastly, in 15, he says, I am the true vine. No one can bear fruit except he abides in me. John 18, 6. Can I request you all to please turn to John 18, 6. So we need to understand when we say Jesus is the I am of the new covenant, the Jews had a greater revelation of this I am. When you study the Old Testament, I am is nothing but God, Yahweh. People, I mean the people, the Jews in those days will not speak or say out God or Yahweh. Or I am, because that is God's name. It's, it's addressing God. And it, that word had a greater power, greater authority, and greater reverence. They held that word with reverence. So one of the areas we see in John 18, 6. Or From 4, we can read from 4. Je Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them. So this is about the betrayal and arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying along with disciples. And now the soldiers come asking who Jesus is. So Jesus is saying, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, that is, when Jesus said to the soldiers, I, ha I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So imagine the power and the authority that Jesus carried by just that word, I am. Just by Jesus releasing. Now see, these soldiers are coming to arrest Jesus. 
they coming they will not come just a casual walk they coming with authority to arrest him and when they carry certain authority jesus carries the authority of heaven the minute he said i am he got the soldiers just fell on the ground look at that power look at the authority look at that power the heavenly power that made the soldiers fall and they are not some ordinary men they just fell off on the ground and the last point we would like to see that where john emphasizes the gospel of john is the son book of the son of god is the sevenfold affirmation of his deity by credible witnesses you know most of the time the witnesses is what adds power so here john is just not making a i witness statement that i saw i witnessed i felt that he is the son of god he is also he is adding weight to this book by saying it's just not only me who feels jesus is the son of god along with me there are other people who have witnessed jesus as the deity as a son of god so he goes on and and just give me a minute i'll change the slide okay i just request you i think this is the last one we'll just see uh, john chapter 1 verse 34 if one can turn john chapter 1 34 the other person you can turn john chapter 1 verse 49 next person john chapter 6 verse 69 next john 10 36 chapter 10 verse 36 Next, John eleven verse twenty seven. And John twenty verse twenty eight. John twenty verse twenty eight. I'm just making a note. John twenty. Okay, these are the few last three scriptures. Okay, when we can I request you all to turn to John chapter one verse thirty four. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So we see John the Baptist to witness that. I have seen. and i testify that he is the son of god so john the baptist came before jesus to prepare the way for jesus ministry the second john chapter 1 verse 49 anyone nathaniel answered and said to him rabbi you are the son of god you are the king of israel thank you so nathaniel is witnessing jesus as the son of god by saying rabbi you are the son of god next verse chapter 6 verse 69 and know that you are the christ so here we see peter witnessing peter is witnessing that jesus is the son of the living god the next verse john 11:27 she said to him yes lord i believe that you are in the you are the christ the son of god who is it to come into the world Here we see Jesus Himself saying, "I said I am the Son of God." And then you read eleven uh, twenty-seven, right? You read eleven twenty-seven. Here we see Martha. 
Martha said, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. If you have taken John 20, verse 28, one of y'all, can y'all please read? So what did Thomas say? Thomas, you know, he had his various doubt on on Jesus, on the deity of Jesus. The minute he clarified his doubt, what did Thomas say? He, he, you know, it is like earnest cry from his heart, saying that, Lord, I'm very sorry for doubting you. And he clarified the deity of Jesus. He just said that, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And the last one, John 20, verse 31. But these are written that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, uh, that believing you may have life in his name. Now, now, John himself, John being the apostle of Jesus Christ, himself gives a witness that Jesus is the Christ and is the Son of God. And as he portrays Jesus as the son of God in the gospel of John, he also gives the human side of Jesus. We also covered the human side in, um, in the gospel of Luke. So I would just like to emphasize because this has been mentioned even in the gospel of John. One is at the wedding of Cana, where Jesus shows that he wants to help this family. He wants to help them out. And at the well of Saika, he's been very tired. He just rested because he was tired and thirsty. And we also see at the grave of Lazarus, Jesus was so uh, emotionally moved. He was very saddened at the loss of his dear friend Lazarus. So what did Jesus do? That is the shortest verse in the whole Bible. What is it? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And in the upper room, what did Jesus do? He washed the feet of his disciples. You know, all this has a human side. And he also showcased on the cross. On the cross, when he was about to die, it was not like very easy. Oh, Jesus is God. So, you know, bearing the cross was very easy. No, even at the cross, he had this pain, separation from the Father. And also, his body was draining out was getting drained out and here he says i am thirsty one of the seven words what did jesus say i'm thirsty so few things that john reveals the human side of jesus as well so that's what we say that you know in christology you will be studying in detail or you would have covered that in christology in detail that jesus was 100 percent god and 100 percent man Okay. Yeah. So I almost covered everything and the gospel of John concludes with a very interesting claim from the eyewitness of John. Uh, can we turn to John chapter 14 verse 12? Sorry, John 21 verse 25. John 21 verse 25. Amen. So very last verse ends saying that there are many other things that Jesus did. It's not just what uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John have recorded here, but there are so much more Jesus did in his ministry of just three and a half years, which cannot be written one by one. If it is recorded, then the world cannot contain a book as big as that. And uh, yeah. This is how John ends this book saying that much more. And he also gives a promise saying that uh, Jesus also assured uh, in uh, John 14, 12. John chapter 14, verse 12. Yeah, assurance, 
John is giving us an assurance that Jesus did greater things on this earth. And he's also giving assurance, you shall do greater things much more than what I have done because I am going to my father and I will send a comforter. Now, who is that comforter? In John 14, 16. 16. Can one of you all please read 16? Yeah. So, assurance that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. And he will abide with you forever. See, in the Old Testament, Holy Spirit used to visit Holy Spirit used to visit the people, the prophets. But then here there's an assurance that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will abide with you forever. So this is what Jesus is assuring each one of us. The Holy Spirit who's abiding in me. And through him you will do greater and mighty things because I am with the Father. And Jesus assures all the disciples that the Spirit of the Lord will teach them all things, recalling to their mind whatever Jesus said and did. And you see, when we study the book of Acts, we will see great and mighty things the apostles did. How did they do? Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we are just getting ourselves prepared to study the next book. The Acts of the Apostles. So when we study that, you'll see how Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, moved among the apostles and they did great and mighty works of what, you know, the assurance that John gives us from the Gospel of John. Okay, with that, we end this session uh, of Gospel of John. If you all have any questions, you all can ask. If you would like to add something. You can please go ahead and add to it. Yes. My beloved, is it? See, uh, it is not Jesus who's saying, John, you are my beloved and not others. It is John love for God. John loved Jesus so much. So it's only written in his letter that I am God, I am Jesus' beloved. He loved me more. He writes like on more on emphasizes more on love. Okay, it's his love. Like Jesus loved everyone equally, even though Peter denied betrayed you know jesus loved everyone jesus did not take the leadership of peter because he betrayed right denied so yeah it is the understanding of john john kept writing in his letters everywhere you see i am the beloved and i was the one who's leaning on the breast or chest of jesus you know he shows himself he it's only he who portrays that he had a very close relationship with Jesus, okay? But then Jesus loved everyone equally. Okay? With that, we will end this session. We will pray and close this session. Father, we thank you that you are the most high God, that you are the son of God. Lord, as the gospel of John reveals that you are the son of God, I pray that you will give each of us the understanding. You will open our eyes, open our heart and mind that we may understand the deity of Christ, that you are truly the son of God. Just like how Thomas said, Lord, my God, Lord, we would like to come into your presence and call out to you that you are my Lord and you are my God. Thank you, Father, for that understanding. Thank you, Lord. As we study each and every book in the New Testament, I pray that you will reveal yourself. You will reveal yourself, the relationship that each of us have with you. So just like how you related in this gospel to Father saying, uh, you related God as your father. Lord, I pray that you will help each one of us, Lord, to come close into that relationship where we can relate to you as our father, as our God. Thank you, Lord, for doing it so. In Jesus' most precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen.
thank you so much for joining in today's session see you all next week until then have a blessed week god bless bye